All right. uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. We're really excited to talk to you today about blockchain, crypto, and the various investment opportunities. Uh, this is, as I'm sure most of you already know, this is a really interesting time for the space because we're coming down off of the massive bull run that ended 2018 when we saw the price of Bitcoin approach $20,000. Now it's lost about 66% of that value. Uh, there's um, ICOs, there's a lot of questions about the future of those as $20 billion plus have been invested in ICOs to this point, yet almost all of them have dropped below their initial sell price. Even retail investors in places like Coinbase have lost 80% of their active traders. But that being said, most people here on the panel will argue that this is actually a good time to be involved in the space because this is when a lot of the really good work is being done and we can focus on some of the most promising initiatives and use cases that blockchain can be applicable to. So with that, uh, uh, we'll let the panel introduce themselves really quickly. Uh, just uh, briefly on myself, uh, as was mentioned, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. We're a global nonprofit trade association that's dedicated to the advancement and adoption of crypto and blockchain technology across all aspects of financial services. We work with everyone from high-speed traders to lawyers to accountants in the space. And uh, obviously, there's a lot to, to keep us busy. Hi, I'm Christina Dolan. I am a co-founder of IX Ledger, which is uh, insurance on the uh, blockchain. We've announced a couple of products so far. Um, and my background is, I'm an engineer, I went to MIT. Um, when I was getting my second master's, I was at the Media Lab when the web browser came out. And I remember uh, working at Hearst and Disney, heading up the development of these first consumer websites when people would say that um, entertainment on the internet wasn't taking off. I was at Oracle launching the uh, e-commerce when people said they didn't think that uh, online shopping was gonna take off. And so uh, I was in um, institutional financial trading software when I got interested in um, this whole uh, Bitcoin blockchain space. And people didn't think it was taking off then either. So, um, but I think differently. So with that, I will move on. <laughs> I'm Evan Morris, I'm a principal at Pythia. We're a venture capital firm that invests in businesses solving real-world problems with blockchain technology. Um, we do equity investments at the seed and Series A. Uh, prior to that, I led the emerging technology group at PitchBook, which was acquired by Morningstar, uh, and worked as an analyst covering financial technology and blockchain. Hi, I'm Sean Keegan. I'm the chairman and managing partner of Digital Strategies. We are a crypto-focused investment management shop that's spun out of a family office. Um, we invest primarily in angel stage deals for crypto companies. We also do smart beta investing in the crypto space. Prior to this, I was working for a family in the LA area doing investing mostly in fund of funds. Uh, and also, I spent some time at a firm called Regular Global Advisors doing smart beta investments in Greater China. All right, great, thanks for that. So to, to kick things off, I want to just ask each of you to talk about what are the use cases for crypto or blockchain that get you most excited about and really get into how that informs your investment thesis. And as a way to kind of frame the discussion, please share like what is the, the framework that you use to make such a determination when it comes to uh, looking at crypto uh, applicability? So um, from my background, being an engineer, I look things a little differently. So I, I think about the fact that there's a lot of millennials out there that think differently, and the financial space is actually already thinking about um, the fact that they're making decisions a lot differently than prior generations. This whole idea of fractional ownership, which impacts like fractional insurance options, uh, different use, uh, you know, fractional use cases. Um, these are all different models that are being driven by uh, by people that have different ways of thinking and different habits. And so um, the technology that exists today in some of these frameworks uh, doesn't necessarily make those ownership or usage models possible. And so uh, I get really excited about what the possibility of that could be. I mean, I, I recognize that the SEC probably has different views than I do, but I think that uh, there's some interesting opportunities there um, in terms of these new ownership and uh, you know, fractional use cases. Yeah, we, uh, we use a pretty traditional venture framework, so looking at product, market, team. Um, we particularly really hone in looking at the problem that the team is trying to solve 
and whether or not that problem actually exists and people are willing to pay for it. Uh, so we do get a lot of pitches that seem like solutions looking for problems. Um, and we try to Can have... You give a, an example, perhaps? Uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, there was a... Uh, we were pitched one that was... It was creating a marketplace for like, waste management. Um, and the whole purpose was essentially they were providing marketing for their corporate partners, but the actual marketplace was really unsustainable. Um, yeah, so we think it varies by currency type, token type, um, product type. So there are certain tokens out there which are designed to be sort of a native currency for some kind of network. Uh, network could be personal, could be machine-based. Um, sometimes the tokens are actually based on an existing current network that already is trying to just back and forth. And the idea of kind of like owning the money supply of a undervalued economy is an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, if you imagine things like, for example, um, a lot of the apps like Telegram, WhatsApp, uh, they have many thousands of people, many millions of people, already trying to transact back and forth. And if you think that there's a going to be push towards people transacting in that way and not wanting to go into dollars and that being how you can pay for you know, a larger fraction of your daily or your annual spend, go ahead and think about it that way. Um, aside from that, we can look at also uh, you know, security tokens, which are tokens which are designed to be a um, just like any other security or any other claim on a business's cash flows or assets. Uh, and for those, you can almost kind of ignore the blockchain part of it and look at the business model first and say, do I want to own this part of the business or not? Okay. Interesting. So, what, if you had to encapsulate what lessons you've learned over the last 12 months, riding the, riding the wave up and then coming down, what would you say uh, are the biggest takeaways? Yeah, um, I think one of the big takeaways that we've learned uh, when looking at kind of the business models, the, the types of projects that we're doing ICOs. <clears throat> by doing an ICO, you're inherently kind of locking yourself into a short convexity business model. So if you're using your own token to fund developing software and the price starts to move against you, that just compounds risk. So I think people try and get into crypto for the non-linearity, um, but it's important to differentiate between, say, Bitcoin, for example, where it's long convexity, where you look at the block reward is decreasing over time, um, and the structures and token economies of a lot of the like, newer projects that you see. Uh, one important lesson we've seen is that the amount of developer activity in the space is almost entirely uncorrelated to price. So even over the course of the past six months where you've had a massive decrease in price of Bitcoin, you've actually seen uh, increasing downloads of software used to code on Ethereum and other blockchains like it. Um, so we think you know, there's a, it's important if you want to be involved in the space to recognize that the price of publicly traded well-known kind of meme coins uh, is not the same thing as the long-term development of the space and long-term um, kind of uh, I would say professionalization of this industry. I mean, I just wanted to add that I kind of look at it this from an engineering perspective mm -hmm. versus the um, just the coin value. And what was interesting about the last 12 months, kind of making a parallel to the web days, is that there was a lot of innovation taking place at hyperspeed. And in the web days, you didn't have this um, sort of open source sharing thing going on where everybody can learn from everybody else and invest in everybody else. So there was a lot of cross-pollination across many different projects, um, trying to resolve and offer for solutions for different things that um, you know then became part of things like Quorum, which is the J.P. Morgan um, you know uh, uh, blockchain that utilizes some aspects of Ethereum without the coin at a higher speed. And then for the data um, security piece, they looked at Zcash and they you know figured out that you know they were doing something interesting and they incorporated that. So there, there was a lot of incredible cross pollination. Um, and then the other point being is in the early days of the web, uh, you know, I worked at Disney and Hearst, and they were buying ads at like 
Yahoo for $70 CPMs to monetize just that home page. And that home page really wasn't that scalable. Um, you know, they were selling for $30 uh, CPMs and only a fraction of the money uh, of those uh, people actually generated money. What became interesting was in the days of Google and Facebook when a completely different model came out and they were basically monetizing the journey of a customer with intent. Very different experience meant every page on the internet sellable and that created a sort of a different type of growth. I, I do think that there's some business models that still have a little work and have to evolve a bit, but from a technology perspective, there was a tremendous amount of innovation that was um, funded through all these processes. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting point, especially the one about, about cross-pollination. A lot of people here are probably trying to figure out if they want to invest in the space, how are they going, how are they going to identify the winners and losers? And the answer may be that there's just going to be a period where people tend to work, converge around one platform, one type type of entity. And, uh, and especially in the technology space where it's so much easier to take advantage of economies of scale and, and perhaps even move towards an oligopoly or, or monopoly. So uh, just as a follow-up, what signs would you look for to see that that's happening? And do you have any sense of if everybody was going to converge in on one platform Maybe you don't know exactly what that platform is, but what are the key properties that it would have to contain? So um, we talked a little bit about this in the green room, about how we live in a world in which you need the journeys of everything. So um, from a compliance perspective in Europe, MIFID is about the journey of a trade. Um, but traditionally, uh, training systems were matching engines, not capturing every aspect of that journey. Um, people don't trust, specifically uh, millennials, right? And if you want to know the provenance of uh, diamond or food or, what, or, or drugs or whatever that might be, um, you need a system that's able to collect this data along the journey because everything today seems to be in these siloed systems and you're not going to be given an API to just suck that data out, right? So these journeys are very valuable and the data that can be captured through these journeys gives you insights that were not available to you because they were you know, trapped in all these siloed systems. And so I do think that there are going to be new business processes and um, new uh, business models that are going to uh, evolve from this. I almost feel like the blockchains that will be used will kind of all depend upon you know, what the nature of the business is. So for example, um, there are laws that prohibit data from leaving country boundaries. So if you're dealing in one of these areas that has um, government, um, you know, restrictions, you're probably going to look at Quorum or uh, Corda from R3 or some of the companies that have actually created these restrictions in their type of blockchain. But if you're working on something that has to do with consumers, something in which you're taking advantage of the token economy and motivation, then you're going to look for other um, types of, of technologies. But I don't necessarily think it's going to be a one-size-fit-all. Yeah, I, have, uh, <clears throat> I think that leads up well to uh, give me an opportunity to talk my book a little bit. One of our investments uh, is called Lucidity in LA, um, and they're a great example of this where they're an ad tech company. And by putting the ad buy process on an immutable ledger, they will, they're able to um, reduce fraud and other bad actors, distorted markets. Um, they had a pilot with Toyota, and they were able to improve their ad campaign performance by over 20%. Um, so I think any use case where there's an opportunity for bad actors or fraud or abuse, um, blockchain provides an opportunity to weed some of that out. And one thing I'll add there is that, you know, there's a lot of talk about how the technology isn't scalable yet and it's kind of working towards that. Uh, important thing to realize is that, you know, sometimes the best tech isn't what wins, but wins is the tech that most adoption. And with that in mind, we sort of want to work with firms that are really focusing on not just building the best, most cool tech out there, but also working on getting customers, having a good go-to-market strategy, and having an actual um, a plan in place to kind of get downloads of the software that you use on their ledger and use their program. And that's kind of what we look in, what we, what we focus on. So just to follow on to that, what are some of the, the lessons that you've learned when you're looking at the, the user experience? I mean, the story that I always like to use when I discuss this point is most people don't even realize that Apple didn't have the first iPhone or that the iPhone wasn't necessarily the best phone out there. But it was intuitive, people liked it, and when my parents opened it, they knew exactly how to use it. And that's the same 
that's basically the same experience we need to have with crypto. People get scared of blockchain. They get scared of the word encryption and don't think that they know how to use it. But at the same point, most people don't know how email works. They just hit send. So what do we have to do to get to that point where people feel feel comfortable with the word blockchain or don't even necessarily need to know that there's a blockchain yeah. behind the app that they're using. Yeah, so right now most of the discourse around the blockchain space is still happening kind of by engineers talking to engineers, which is not the way to grow a business. Um, what? No. <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with engineers. They're fantastic. They're important. But like, Talk you need more than just that to actually, you know, you understand how people work as well, right? Um, you know, one thing is that, you know, the reason why Apple won versus the PC for consumers in certain markets market is that they had a really good design team, right? Um, so, and even now, kind of the most, uh, some of the most well-known and most publicized successes in the blockchain space have succeeded because they have a really, really good design front end. Uh, for example, again, in the Ethereum space, this app called CryptoKitties, you buy and sell tokens and buy and sell coins that kind of had a front end that looked like a cute cat Pokemon kind of thing, right? There are things like that which are, you know, they don't really serve utility, per se, but people enjoy buying them, enjoy having them, and they really engage with the platform. Uh, similarly, Coinbase was valued at around $8 billion in the celebration round, and they really succeeded in the space because they had a really good user-facing front end. Um, so, in terms of lessons learned, again, it's like, you know, don't look just at the tech. Look for people who have a design sensibility and a, uh, they are producing more than just technology backgrounds. So I want to make a little parallel to the internet days again. And um, I was a co-founder of a company we took public that was um, an ISP. We grew it to be the 10th largest in the, in the country. And um, we built these geographic communities around the pops. And I was explaining to my sons that, you know, I, I built this company. And um, my sons were like, well, that's stupid. Why don't you just do, like, was, why wasn't it Wi-Fi? Why did you have dial-up pops, right? And I'm like, well, the technology didn't exist. But what's interesting, my kids don't really think about, um, you know, having to dial into the internet. They don't think about all of the logistics that you had to think about. I mean, you needed to have manuals and modems and a bunch of different things that made it kind of a gnarly interface. And I think that the crypto is there right now. Um, but what's interesting is that there are going to be more and more applications in which you're going to use your smartphone, not even know there's blockchain behind it. And there's one that was done by RiskBlock, which is sort of a consortium in the insurance space, whereby um, it, you know, it, it would actually take your, uh, your driver's license, your registration, and your, um, your insurance. And if you know, either any of those changed state and they were not valid, um, if you were pulled over, you would have a QR code on your phone, just like when you go through the airport and you're putting your phone in for the scanner, and the, um, the uh, police officer would just have to scan that, and they would know whether or not all three of those documents were uh, you know, uh, up to date or not, right? And so it simplified that process. Now, at the end of the day, would anybody know that it was on blockchain? Like, absolutely not. But the value proposition, you know, saves a lot of time. So I, I, do, I don't necessarily think that the end result will be as gnarly as it is now. And I think this whole thing about passwords, um, you know, being sort of the key that unlocks your ownership, um, you know, there's going to have to be some resolution around that that comes out. Yeah, and we've invested in a couple identity companies because um, that is a huge issue around the consumer adoption side. But I think we are so early that uh, we'll have to look at you know Microsoft strategy in the 90s, the famous Steve Ballmer speech where he got up on stage and was like jumping around yelling, developers, developers, developers. <laughs> and uh, you'll have to look at which platforms are attracting developers and we're even so early that there aren't really a ton of developer tools or just SDKs for people to work off of, online resources, even the Ethereum community is still pretty small on the engineering side. So we're still early days. Sure. So I, I want to spend a little time now just talking about funding models because ICOs uh, became so well known but there's a good argument to be made and, and did a lot of good but I think there's an argument to be made, and a, and a strong one, that they actually did a disservice in this space um, for, for a number of reasons. I mean, one, a lot of people invested in companies that were outright frauds, or perhaps they were backed by well-meaning entrepreneurs that had no business raising the amount of money that they actually did and had no chance to actually deliver on their promises. Or many investors don't even realize that 
a good deal of the most high profile ICOs, the Telegram for instance, at close to $2 billion, was done completely through private sales, private placement. So ordinary people that would actually want to get access to these tokens couldn't buy them until they uh, or couldn't buy those and couldn't buy other ones until they got listed on exchanges at a premium ba compared to what the institutional and accredited investors purchased. That said, most people would probably also agree that the, um, that the VCs on Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley unfairly get to choose the, the winners and losers in, uh, in the digital space. So I feel like there has to be some sort of happy medium and I'm interested to hear what the three of you think about that. So regarding ICOs, they aren't perfect, but I think that the, the trend towards tech firms raising more money from private funding as opposed to public funding isn't really new, and it's certainly new in the United States either. Um, you know, a lot of the big tech firms now, Uber, for example, are really postponing going public because it's easier to kind of like have a high risk tech business funded privately as opposed to publicly. So it's not crazy to see why that would be happening in this space too. But the the idea that this is a decentralized type of technology right, should yeah. not be done in that way and, and doing ICOs through private placement almost seems... Uh, sure, there's, uh, a huge, yeah. there's, a, there's a huge kind of intellectual contradiction in the idea of you know ICOs being centralized, community-based, and also having all this money went towards like I think 86 firms for Telegram for example, right? Like, um, So again, I think that this is one of those things where like you know, blockchain is a tool as opposed to a philosophy, right? Um, it's kind of appeals to people who have this kind of like decentralized free market philosophy, but it's not all it's really good for. Um, you know, in the US, for example, we have a lot of you have years now of history from the Jobs Act going onward of trying to enable smaller ticket people to invest in tech startups. And in fact, blockchain can be used to probably enable that. Um, there's a lot of blockchain-based crowdfunding platforms out there. ICOs are a version of that. Um, and with things like Regex or Regex Plus, like we can see, um, you know, blockchain being used to democratize access to investing. Um, although, again, you're right, it hasn't been the priority of people in the space for a long time. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we don't invest in tokens or ICOs at all. Uh, we prefer to invest in product-first companies. Um, so we found that teams that are, you know, raising millions and millions of dollars before they have a product. Um, don't really have their eye on the right prize. Um, raising ICO is just a huge time suck. Uh, you have to do you know, a lot of panels like these, fly around to conferences, answer questions from investors, uh, manage a community, be active on social media. Um, and we just don't see that as a positive signal for a successful business. So I, I just want to add a little bit of a different tone to this because, um, I mean, one, so I don't know how many people here play video games, probably not that many, but um, I mean, I have children who play um, Roblox and Roblox as a game, um, the kids create the environment, right? They're kind of product developers, right? And, um, and then they invite their friends to join. So then they're doing the marketing as well. And they do it for pride points. And um, the, they make sure that their um, ecosystem succeeds because they have so much pride that they want it to succeed, right? And, um, and, and kids have been doing this in the ninth generation of video games for some time. And, and then that behavior does in some way correlate when you have these ecosystems that people are part of and they want them to win, right? And there's a whole philosophy around uh, the token economy that starts with how they use it for... for um, you know, how they use it for autistic children, and you think about how social media use brain hacking, and, um, you know, it can go on for that for hours. But, um, but it's interesting, you can't completely discount the fact that when you create an ecosystem of, of people that are engaged in something, from a marketing perspective, that is hugely valuable. And in the early days of the ICO world, where that community was so engaged, and they cross-pollinated and shared ideas, and invested in each other, there's a tremendous amount of innovation that was going on, and it helped the these groups succeed and share ideas. And so if you were to go out and buy that for a private company, it's like hugely expensive. So, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, the, 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 you know, the texture changed in that whole yeah. world, but there was a tremendous amount of idea sharing and a community was very supportive of trying to get these ideas to succeed. And I think that it sped up a lot of, um, you know, uh, you know, innovation. Yeah, I think to the same point, I mean, 
the amount of talented developers who are working in the space is really mind blowing to me, even now. Um, and you know, people don't realize that the the token market is still very, very small. Um, you know, right now, the I think as of this morning, uh, the combined capitalization of all coins are around two hundred billion dollars. That's still like one fourth of Apple's market cap, mm -hmm. right? In terms of thinking of how many people are actually activists in the space, hold these tokens. Uh, want to increase their value, right? There's probably a lot more people working on various token-based projects than working at Apple, right? And so, is it can I buy Apple for one for the price now? I probably would. Uh, just a, a quick question for Evan. Uh, it's hard to imagine that there's anybody in the blockchain space that has had a successful exit exit at this point. I can only think of a, a couple companies that have really had one. So, yeah. how do you? What's your strategy for evaluating? companies when they come to you looking for funding, given the fact that nobody in the world has more than 10 years of crypto experience? Yeah, I think uh, successful experience in related domains is a positive signal. Um, just looking at their financials, um, you know, if they seem reasonable, they have a path to revenue, product roadmap. Uh, our team... Uh, is very deep technically. I'm kind of the non-technical, more business person. Um, so we have a couple of people that have been in crypto since the beginning um, that can, you know, tear down their product roadmap and technical plan in great depth. Uh, we also have a full-time general counsel since, as I'm sure you're well aware, there's a lot of regulatory issues in the space. Um, there's new news every day in various jurisdictions. Um, so her full-time job is to stay on top of that and making sure that the companies that are pitching us and that we are investing in are fully compliant. Mm -hmm. And actually leads me to my last question before we, we open it up. I'd like to hear what each one of you think about um, the, the regulatory landscape that, that crypto faces. What is, uh, what is most important to you uh, when it comes to thinking of how you're going to invest in this space? So. There's a lot of jurisdictional choice and jurisdiction mm -hmm. shopping happening in the space. Mm -hmm. um, you find sort of a, almost a race to the bottom from just like Malta, even the Cayman Islands, trying to be the most crypto friendly area. Um, there is pros and cons to that. So uh, essentially, it makes it easier to find real innovation that can be poured into larger economies. But you also occasionally have you know less investor protection than you realize, um, which is kind of why it's still a buyer beware market. Right, like uh, we have to see people who are, and, and again, if you were to have, you know, we actually like the fact that the SEC is getting more involved. They're trying to um, not only uh, prosecute well-known frauds. They've now we're actually looking to people who are violating the custody rule, for example, for um, for funds. Um, ultimately, you know, like there's regulations just for a reason, right? Um, sometimes having you know a policeman in the room is a good thing. Uh, and we think that's a good thing for the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing that we've noticed too uh, that our GC pointed out is that um, at least earlier this year, you could tell who a project's general counsel was or outside counsel they retained based on their corporate structure. So I see increased commentary from regulatory bodies um, to create kind of more consistent frameworks for companies to focus less on compliance and staying you know, in, in fair play yeah. um, versus building products. And so I actually have been more involved in innovation overseas than I have here just because of the fact that the regulatory landscape is um, somewhat of an unknown. But in terms of evaluating ideas, um, I don't start with the regulatory piece first. I think about the business model and the value proposition that um, could be created by utilizing what I call uh, a thin layer of blockchain for the provenance journey and trust, along with a lot of other services, which are also very innovative and evolving in order to sort of create new ecosystems and new business opportunities that are much more efficient than what you have today. Yeah, that's, it's, it's an interesting point. I mean, when we speak with regulators, there's always the, the question of, like, should we 
legislate this technology in particular, or should we find ways to sort of give guidance on how existing regulations apply to this new technology? I, I, I tend to fall into the latter category, as I would probably suspect yeah. you all do too. And uh, being here in New York with the bit license, where it led to uh, an exodus of, of, of companies leaving the space because the, it just was too expensive or too burdensome to apply for the, for the bit license, the, the, the journey, I'm sorry, the, uh, I guess the jury is still out on what the best way the best way forward. Um, and I also am very interested to see what's going to happen with the development of self-regulatory organizations and, and basically codes of conduct among uh, companies within um, certain jurisdictions and with certain industries that try to self-police in order to give governments and legislators more time to let the technology develop before they need to come in with perhaps too heavy of a hand. So uh, with, with that, I think we're getting close on time. So I'd like to see if there's any... If I'm, um, so we have about five minutes left. Uh, questions? Yeah, so you mentioned network tokens at the beginning. Um, I'm particularly interested in that and whether there's any uh, good ones out there that actually are working or being used and where you see that going forward. So when I say network tokens, I guess what I'm referring to is tokens are used to act as a payment system for a different network. Um, there are reasons to think that that could be valuable. Um, at this point, though, there's, it's, there's Ethereum is probably the biggest example of one that's being used currently, where a token is being used in some transaction. Uh, same thing with Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, those networks. Um, I think that there is a lot of uncertainty around it, uh, but it's like the web in the early days, where you weren't quite sure how it could be used until you saw it used that way. Um, so we saw all of our LPs, like, you know, investing in tokens like that should definitely be a small part of your portfolio. But there is a world in which that sort of use case for a token pays off in a really big, surprising way. And your, the right allocation to hedge against that kind of disrupting your other businesses is greater than zero. So I would say it's less about finding the actual token which is working right now, but we're saying, hey, like, this be could become the next big thing. And it's worth having some kind of hedge against it by owning some of these tokens. I actually think this boiling the ocean and trying to create the, you know, the Ethereum killer or the Bitcoin killer is, I think, um, thinking a little too grand because uh, we're now at past this what I call we call a like cross pollination stage in which all these ideas um, actually created a lot of other ideas and you know people were advising on one went to another and there was just a lot of great uh, innovation that happened as a result of that. But now um, there are some quiet implementations that are taking place whereby they have their first customers. Um, they have you know the business model figured out um, in one scenario uh, of this uh, group of one's a former MIT student you know they've figured out the regulatory landscape they've partnered with the right partners to streamline that process and they're rolling it out right with um, you know sort of a lean uh, raise that they've they've done so I think that there's been a, a lot of innovation that's taking place which will inspire some really exciting um, disruptive uh, implementations but I don't think you're going to get like the ICO, you know, headline type thing going on. They're happening very quietly and, um, you know, very entrepreneurially. And I think that those are going to, you know, be very exciting. Um. Yeah, I think we're uh, starting to enter kind of more of the deployment phase, as uh, Carlota Perez would call it. Um, and we'll see value start to accrue to the projects that start shipping code and building actual software. Um, creating great experiences for users and developers. Yeah. Angie. I love that question because nobody focuses on that. And there is all this innovation happening in terms of microservices and which have been deployed in things like Uber and Netflix. And there's all these technologies going on that are making those use cases really exciting because you have all these journeys that have to be followed. And we have all these moving parts and siloed systems that have to be gathered to create these journeys. And so there's so much innovation going on there. I mean, I work in a couple of projects, but um, I won't bore you with the details. But anyway, um, that is like my favorite topic. And so the, with regard to the insurance piece of it, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about insurance 
insurance is that um, you know there are some dyed in the wool processes that work and there's you know flow that happens and you know things like auto insurance and home insurance you know they have certain partners and distribution channels and you're not going to disrupt those it just doesn't make sense right but there's these new business models in which you have these different use cases driven by millennials in which like for example you know fractional usage fractional ownership um, the whole mobility space I mean there's there's a ton of opportunities in there in which it's not, um, you know, you're not disrupting an existing insurance model because of these are new uh, use cases. And so that requires uh, a, a real deep dive in terms of the information and how you, you know, gather that information and record the information and then be able to provide that to the insurance companies to un understand that risk. So it's very exciting to me because I am an engineer and I don't know what the regulatory side is of all that stuff. But anyway, um, there's some really exciting things happening there. But the whole idea of the IoT piece and the, you know, microservices and all the technologies evolving around that, which Uber and other companies that are dealing with massive, massive numbers of transa transactions are dealing with without the blockchain, um, is an area where there's a tremendous, a tremendous amount of innovation going on. It's really exciting. Are there maybe one last question? Looks like we taught everybody everything they need to know. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.